Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Our Savior Lutheran Church. Wonderful to gather with you on one of my favorite Sundays of the year. At 11 o'clock, we will be administering the rite of confirmation to nine confirmands, so an exciting day in the life of our church. But you know, in a real sense, every Sunday is Confirmation Sunday, isn't it? We gather to confess our sins, to confess our faith, to hear God's promise, and to be confirmed again that in fact God's promise is for us. And so, will you join with, with me now as we pray for our confirmands and even pray for our own confirmation. Father, we give you thanks for the good work that you have begun in the lives of these nine confirmands. And Lord, for the good work that you've done in all of our lives, bring us to your Son, Jesus Christ, through the waters of baptism, raising us on your word and teaching us to hear your voice and confirming again and again and again your promises to us, promises for life, for forgiveness, for salvation. Lord, we pray in these few minutes that we have together here today for your spirit to be at work to fill us and to strengthen us in faith that our grip may be firm in the face of the challenges we face in this world. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. I invite you to please rise. <laughs> Remembering our baptism, we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We have come to worship our great God. However, in our sinful condition, we cannot get near to him. Let us confess our sins to God and one another. I confess to you.
by the grace of God, there is one who is worthy to take our request for forgiveness to God's throne of grace. Jesus Christ alone is worthy, for he is God's own lamb and has ransomed us from our sins by dying for us and rising in glory. He declares us to be saints, able to go to God in all confidence, and priest, offering our prayers for one another and for all people. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. be with you. Let us pray. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated for the readings. The first reading for the third Sunday of Easter is recorded in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. This can be found on page 917 in your pew Bible. Here Jesus appears to Saul on his road to Damascus, and then Saul goes on to proclaim him to be the Son of God. Acts chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the people, the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, He approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. 
Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has seen me so that you may regain your sight and be fulfilled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is recorded in Revelation chapter 3, verses 5, excuse me, 8 through 14, and can be found on page 1031, 1031 in your pew Bible. Here we hear the songs praising the Lamb as worthy. Revelation chapter 5. And when he had taken when and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, singing, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, for every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the, er under the earth and in the sea and all that is them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading comes from John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. This will also serve as the sermon text. John 10, beginning in verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, 
for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated, and I invite the children to come forward for the children's message. All right, kiddos, I hope you are ready. We are going to play a game this morning. We are going to see how many voices you can recognize. So we're going to play a couple audio clips. You're going to hear them on the speakers, but you're not going to be able to see their picture. And as soon as you know the voice, I want you to raise your hand. All right? Is everybody ready? Should we let the grown-ups play too? Yeah, okay. We'll let the grown-ups play too. So as soon as you know the voice, raise your hand. All right, let's listen to the first one. Grown-ups didn't do so well. Who is this? Baby shark. All right. Well, we'll keep going. Maybe they'll do a little better. Good job. All right. Let's play the next one. Everything is awesome. Okay. Um. Lego. Yeah, from the Lego movie. Good. Good. What is Emmett from the Lego. Even more specific. Did anyone know that was Emmett from the Lego movie? No. Nope. They knew. Okay. All right. Let's play the next one. Y'all are doing great. Throw frozen, yes. Yes, okay, good, good. All right, I think we have one more. Viet- <laughs> All the letters of the alphabet. Oh, Elmo. From a- Elmo, that's right. Okay, y'all, I kind of feel bad for the grown-ups. Like, they did terrible on this. <laughs> so I'm going to play one that I think any of you all are going to know, but I just want them to have one that they might recognize, okay? All right, play the next one. To every person trapped in tyranny, whether in the Ukraine, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Cuba, or Vietnam, we send our love and support. That was a little easier, wasn't it? (laughs) President Ronald Reagan. Yes. So if you were reading or you were listening to the readings this morning, you heard a story about a man named Saul, and Jesus spoke to him. And Saul said, who's talking to me? He didn't recognize the voice, did he? But, but then Jesus tells the story of the sheep who do recognize the voice of the shepherd. And they hear his voice and they follow him. Now, the reality is we hear a lot of voices, sometimes voices in our own head. You might hear a voice in your own head that says, go ahead and take the cookie. Mom will never know. Do you think that's Jesus' voice? No, no. God's Word tells us that we should honor our parents and do what they want, right? Okay, what about this one? You're in the library with a friend, and your friend's just talking, talking, chatting, chatting, not paying attention, and then she has a big old pile of books, and she trips and falls, and her books go everywhere. And you hear a voice that says, she should pay more attention, and maybe picking those books up by herself will teach her a lesson. Now, before you answer this, we're going to listen to one more voice. Now, it's not actually Jesus' voice. Do we know what Jesus' voice sounded like? Not really, do we? This is actually Max McLean, but he kind of sounds like Jesus to me because he reads the Bible, and I listen to him read the Bible all the time. So Max is going to read some of Jesus' words. So remember, you're standing in the library. Your friend's books are all over the ground, and then you hear this voice. Go ahead and play the last one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you hear one voice that says, well, my friend wasn't paying attention. She should just pick all those books up by herself. But you hear another voice, the voice of Jesus that says we should love our neighbor. Which voice do you think we should listen to? Jesus. Oh, y'all are so smart. Do you know like when a pastor asks you who, there's like 74% chance the answer is Jesus. So you can always guess if you don't know, but, but you're right. You're right. But the only way we listen to Jesus' voice is if we can recognize his voice. Do you know how we learn to recognize Jesus' voice, even though we don't know what he sounded like? Yes. How? The Bible. The Bible. That's exactly right. In fact, we hear Jesus' voice on every page of the Bible, don't we? So here's what I want you all to do. I want you to hear God's word. I want you, when you're in church, to listen to the readings. When the sermon's being preached, you listen to the sermon. When the songs are being sung, to pay attention to the words. When you're at home, to open your Bibles. When you're at home, to tell mom and dad, hey, would you read to me from the Bible? And you can tell them that's Jesus' voice speaking to them at that point, okay? You can go ahead and tell them, yeah, that's, that's God telling you, read, your, read the Bible to me. And you will learn to recognize Jesus' voice. And when you're out there and you face all sorts of situations, you'll have that voice telling you and giving you direction and assurance and comfort and peace and guidance. Pretty good deal, isn't it? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we hear a lot of voices. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to believe and obey your voice. Amen. All right, we can return to your seat. I invite you all to please stand. seated we pray father we pray along with the children we acknowledge and confess that we hear many voices many voices that are not from you and Lord at times we even follow those voices but Lord now we pray that you might capture our attention that you might quiet our hearts that you might clear our mind that we might hear your voice that we might hear your voice through your very word and that word would come to lead and guide us 
and following the Good Shepherd. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the confirmands will be sitting up front at the 11 o'clock service, and they are not here, but you still get to hear the confirmation service sermon. Now, why is that? Kids today have grown to be a bit skeptical, if you've not noticed. They hear a lot of big promises, a lot of click this, and you will find happiness. And they've learned those promises are rarely true. That presents a challenge when it comes to kids raised in the faith. They hear a lot of great promises in church, but the world has taught them to be skeptical of those promises. But the one factor that can make a huge difference is when kids see grown-ups trusting those promises. When kids see grown-ups listening to his word and allowing his word to lead and direct and guide their lives, kids pay attention. Kids tend to believe the promises are true when they see you and they see me living as if those promises are true. So you're getting a confirmation sermon this morning because the sermon is a challenge to you to follow the shepherd and to lead the way for the sheep that come behind you. The challenge of confirmation is it feels like the end of a journey. It certainly does to the kids who have gotten up on Saturday mornings throughout the year to spend three hours with their favorite pastors and youth leaders. We invite friends and family. We give them gifts. We pray for them. We bring them a cake. All the markings of a graduation, the finishing of a journey. And we would love the nice story that, that these kids were raised in the church. They were baptized at a young age. They were put in Sunday school. They learned the Bible. And then they learned the small catechism and confirmation and lived happily ever after until they arrived safely in heaven. It's a nice story, but I can see the smirks on your face. You know it's not your story, and it's not their story. It's a nice story, but, but the story they are going to live, the story you are living is actually a great story. And in great stories, you know there's going to be a villain. Without the big bad wolf, Little Red Riding Hood is just a thrip, trip through the woods to Grandma's house. Without the Wicked Witch of the West, the Wizard of Oz is just a slightly strange stroll down a yellow brick road. Without Darth Vader, it's just the Jetsons with lightsabers. Do you think the kids have watched the Jetsons? Oh. Your story is a great story. And in every great story, there's a villain, a villain who opposes you. Jesus describes this enemy as a thief, a murderer, and a destroyer. He says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. This thief is actively opposed to Jesus and his kingdom. But because Jesus has called you by name through the waters of baptism and claimed you as his own, this thief, this enemy, opposes you as well. This thief, the devil, his intent is to steal, kill, and destroy your faith, even your very life. But of course, that's not the whole story. Just as every great story has a villain, every great story has a hero. Luke Skywalker comes to rescue the princes. William Wallace comes to set Scotland free. Aslan lifts the curse of the White Witch. Aragorn returns as the king. You know the hero of your story. The hero of your story is Jesus. For you were born into the kingdom of darkness, enslaved to sin, and under the curse of death. But Jesus came. He came for you. He came to give his life to rescue you from sin, death, and the devil, and to give you life abundant. Jesus says, yes, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but, but I have come that they, that you may have life and have it abundantly. This abundant life is, is an eternal life, 
a life without end in the presence of God. But, but it's, it's more than a long-lasting life. It, it means life in all its fullness. The Concordia Study Bible describes it this way. It says this abundant life is an infinitely high quality of life in living fellowship with God both now and forever. This life includes the forgiveness of sins and so much more. It's the life your heart longs for, a life of peace in a world of conflict, a life of courage in a world of fear, a life of hope in a world of despair. It's joy and love and purpose and significance and beauty and adventure. This is the life that Jesus invites us into. But we don't always experience this abundant life, do we? Your enemy, the devil, opposes this abundant life. So even for Christians, we can become discouraged and anxious, fearful and defeated, angry and unkind. If we were to have the confirmants here, just like the children and the children's message, and we were to say, well, well, when you find yourself in those places, where, where do you turn to find the abundant life? And then they would say, Jesus. And it's an easy answer to give in church, isn't it? We know it's the right answer. But you don't live your life in church. You live your life out there in a world that's under the influence of the devil. The enemy, the devil, offers life. Sometimes the devil acts in horrific ways, but far more often the devil acts in subtle ways. He offers you life, but he's a liar. His offer leads to death and destruction. But out there in the world, it can look like life. I have a compass here. Actually, I don't. I left it over here. I have a compass here. And I got to thinking, wouldn't it be great, kind of like Captain Jack Sparrow, if you had a compass that always pointed to the abundant life? When you're out there in the world and you're tempted or discouraged or defeated, you could pull your compass out and say, I need to go that way. Wouldn't that be great? The truth is, God has given you a compass just like this that points to the abundant life. It's called your heart. But there's a problem. There's a problem. Actually, two problems. While your friends will tell you, follow your heart, your heart has been damaged by sin. It's a little off. It no longer points to true north. It's like the needle is a little bent. Your heart still desires the abundant life. It desires beauty and love and meaning, but now it points to things like pleasure and possessions and likes on social media. Things that feel like life in the moment, but ultimately do not satisfy the heart's longing for the abundant life that only Jesus can provide. The problem with a compass that's a little off is it will get you way off. NASA, or I should say Elon Musk today, shot a rocket towards the moon, and it were only one degree off, just, just the slightest, one tick of the compass off. On launch, you would have no clue that it was off course. A mile into its flight, it would only be 92 feet off course. The moon's a big target, 92 feet, less than half a football field. But by the time that rocket reached the moon, it probably actually wouldn't reach the moon, it would be over 4,000 miles off course. A compass that's a little off can't be trusted to get you to your destination. A heart that's a little off can't be trusted to lead you to the abundant life. But there's a second problem. Not only is your compass a little off, your enemy, the devil, messes with your compass. I, I, won't, I think Florin did it for me one year. I won't ask you to do it again, Florin. I think Matt may have done it one year. I can't remember. But I'll invite one of the kids up. 
and to tell me which direction is north. Do you all know which direction is north? Half of y'all are like me, like, I don't know, I got to get outside and see something out there. That's north, right? And I'll, I'll have the kid hold the compass, and I'll ask him which way is north, and, and he'll say, that's north. And I'll show him the magnet that throws off the compass. We live in a world full of magnets, don't we? Temptations put there by the devil to throw off your compass, to lead you astray, to trick you to move towards death rather than life. So if you can't trust your heart to lead you to the abundant life, where do you turn? You must look beyond your heart, outside yourself, to the words of the Good Shepherd. Jesus says the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The sheep follow him for they know his voice. The sheep that don't fall for the lies of the thief who has come to steal, kill, and destroy are the sheep who know his voice. The sheep have discovered a reliable compass to lead them to the abundant life. It's Jesus' very words. It's the voice we see on every page of the Bible. See, the, the difficulty of confirmation is we teach them right answers, which is good and necessary. They fill in the blank. They pass the test. We interview them and interact with them and, and ask them to talk more about their faith. But it's not enough just to know right answers, is it? You need to be so familiar with Jesus' words that when you're out there in the world and you're hearing all sorts of voices, that you quickly hear and identify that that is not from Jesus that that looks good to everyone around me, but, but I know Jesus speaks a different word. And I know his word. And because I know his word, these voices are exposed for what they really are. And that's why confirmation isn't the end of a journey, and I hope it's not the end of your journey. I hope no one here looks back at their confirmation as the basis of their faith. Well, at least I was confirmed. I know that. Confirmation is like... It's like getting through basic training in the army. You've, you've, you've finished the basic course, the basic training, but now you're moving out to the front lines. You're on your way to join a cosmic battle that began before Adam and Eve and will conclude with the return of Christ the King. Our victory is assured, but there are many battles to be fought between now and then. My admonition to you today and certainly to the confirmands, keep hearing the voice of Jesus. Read his word. Study his word with others. Come to church and actively listen to the scriptures that are read, the songs that are sung, the sermons that are preached, the words that are shared. It's your only reliable guide to the abundant life. When you're lost or hopeless or confused, hear God's word for you. When life is going well, hear God's word for you, for God's word will always lead you home. His word will lead you to God's heart. His word will lead you to God's people, his church. Since we don't have the right of confirmation in this service, I'm going to ask Olivia Jablinski to come forward. I want her to share just a few words about the confirmands, what they've been through, and what they face as they move on from confirmation. Olivia, share with us. There we go. <laughs> Good morning. Um, so we've got another great class of confirmands this year. We've got nine of them getting confirmed with us later today. Um, and we've had a lot of fun getting to know them. We've gotten to spend some time one-on-one -on -one with them, I'm sure. Most of them don't love it, but we have meetings with them one-on-one -on -one with myself and the pastors, which is actually really fun for us because we get to know them a little bit better, but I'm sure they feel like they're under the gun. <laughs> um, we've quizzed them, and we've tried to impart as much wisdom as we can and cram into the time that we have with them. Um, but as they take this next step of their faith, they're going to continue to face challenges that are going to seek to draw them away from the faith. Um, it's no secret today that kids face a lot of added pressures and distractions 
and a barrage of messages that they have to sort through and try to navigate in this world. And um, so while you might not be here later to see them get confirmed, um, if you do see them later or if you think about them or any of our students, I just hope that you would initiate with them, that you would encourage them in their faith, that you would pray for them. Um, and not just today, but also uh, beyond as they go in their walk. So even all of those who are still in our youth program who have been confirmed and continue to face these challenges. Um, one of the biggest indicators of children and youth remaining in the faith continues to be um, the example and the intentionality of older believers interacting with them and being a presence in their life. Um, and that's where you guys come into play. And it's a really special and important role. So I just, I pray that we as a congregation would come around them as the body of believers that we are um, to encourage them and spur them on in the faith, um, in the face of whatever life brings them and to continue to keep them in our prayers. Um, I hope that our joy and certainty in who and what we believe would be the example that our students see um, and would experience through their relationships with us that would encourage them um, to continue in the faith as well. So, thank Great. Thank you, Olivia. And I should have mentioned Olivia is our Director of Christian Education, and she oversees our confirmation program uh, and helps us teach the confirmands along with uh, Pastor Radke and myself. Well, again, at 11, I'll ask the kids a series of questions, but they're not here, so I'm going to ask you some questions. Are you willing to continue seeking to hear God's voice through his word? Are you willing to teach the confirmands as you were given opportunity? Are you willing to set the pace to go ahead as you follow your shepherd, leaving an example for this, the younger sheep to follow? If so, I'm going to ask you to please stand, to please stand to indicate your willingness to do so. At 11, at this point, I'll ask the confirmands to look to the north, to see a whole army of brothers and sisters in the faith who have their back, who are willing at any time and any place to pray with them, to speak to them, to answer their questions, to simply encourage them in the faith. We pray. Father, we give you thanks again that it is your grace and your mercy that these confirmands are here today, and it's your grace and your mercy that we are here today the many ways you have intersected our lives with your word, you have confronted and, and encouraged and exhorted and pleaded and welcomed us back again and again and again. Father, we pray for these confirmands, that they would sink deep roots into your word, that those roots would be nourished and bear fruit, that they would know what it is to walk with you for a lifetime. Father, I pray for us as well. Lord, give us opportunities to encourage and speak to them, to pray for them, to remember them, and to fight with them against the world that's so opposed to their faith. Father, we entrust them to your care in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's now confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God. now pray for the church and for all people according to their need. Gracious Lord, one generation of your saints commends your works to another. As we have received your glorious gospel, grant all fathers and mothers strong and joyful faith to, de to declare your mighty acts to the generation to come. Grant to the saints to be confirmed today a true and persevering faith, a firm grip on your gospel promises and a sure hope in the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, Lord enthroned in heaven, 
You have ordered all the nations of the earth and have set your church among them to shepherd them into eternal life. Hear the prayers we continually offer for our rulers and grant them a faithful and peaceful reign. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Compassionate Lord, you are glorified in the sufferings of your faithful people. Teach us to trust you through all our trials and graciously bear up those who struggle among us, that they would know the fullness of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord, you have prepared a feast again for us on this morning of your son's resurrection. Help us to rejoice greatly in this gift of his body and blood and to receive it to our eternal good, that we too would rise at the last day. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship with the gathering of our tithes and offerings. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who alone is worthy of honor and glory for his victory over death and the grave. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and
remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Welcome to the Lord's table. You may be seated.
Please rise. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, please have a seat. We've got some announcements. In fact, we have two video announcements. Ushers will be passing out the popcorn momentarily. Um, the first one is on VBS, and the second one is an opportunity. You'll hear from President uh, Harrison, the president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, uh, of a great opportunity we have to bless our neighbor, Hope Women's Center. So uh, we're just going to roll both videos, and then I'll wrap up with a few quick announcements. Guys, look at that. That's amazing. Uh-huh. Whoa, look over there. Have you guys seen anything as massive as that? Great. Those cliffs are huge. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Well, we're here. Looks like everyone else just got here too. It's time to look up. There's more to life than what's on your screen. off-road on the adventure of a lifetime and experience the greatness of God's love. Explore colorful canyons of the Southwest from a rock solid faith and discover that God is monumental. Vacation Bible School is back. We are so excited to welcome hopefully hundreds of kiddos through our brand new doors and into this wonderful sanctuary to praise God, learn about Him, and share His incredible, indescribable, awesome love with others. Kids four years old through entering fifth grade can sign up to join the fun, and everyone sixth grade or older can sign up to volunteer. It's an experience you will not want to miss. Invite your friends, neighbors, and relatives, and anyone. Scan the QR code or sign up online to register by this Wednesday to guarantee your t-shirt size. We are looking forward to a great week. It's June 6th through the 10th, 9 a.m. to noon. What a great way to kick off the summer, and it's free. Hope to see you there. Whoever sees his brother in need and closes his heart, how can the love of God remain in him? We've got something very special to announce. Each year in the U.S., over one million children die from abortions. Thousands of Lutherans are speaking up for life and advocating that abortion would end, that all people would come to value life as our Heavenly Father does. Lutherans teach our world about God's gift of life from conception to natural death and his design for marriage and the family. We also walk with women who are vulnerable to abortion to help and care for them, encouraging them through word and deed to choose life for their babies. The people of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod love children, their mothers and their fathers. We show this love in deed and truth as we actively share Christ's love, compassion and mercy for our neighbors by supporting families so that they are not alone facing difficult situations as life begins. In 2022, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod will offer $1 million in matching grants to LCMS congregations for their local beginning of life, pro-life mercy efforts as they provide spiritual, emotional, and physical care to strengthen families across the United States. This initiative, which we are calling the First John 3, 
million dollar match. Through this million dollar match, our church body will contribute two million dollars, one million dollars from the National Synod, which will be matched by each congregation who receives a grant and thousands of volunteer hours. We can't wait to begin. God bless you and strengthen you as you serve. In your happenings, there's a whole page telling a little bit more about this million dollar match, but it's an opportunity we are going to take advantage of. Now, they're not gonna give us the whole million dollars, but they will match up to $50,000. So if we raise 1,000, they'll match it and we'll have 2,000 to go to the Ministry of Hope Women's Center. If we raise 10, they'll give us another 10. You can do the math. Depending on how much we raise, combined with the match from the LCMS, we'll be able to provide some significant resources. On the high end, would be paying the salary of a nurse, which right now is their bottleneck, which is the limiting factor for them serving more women is they need another nurse on staff. We can provide that. We could fill their room for expectant mothers with car seats and, and strollers and whatnot. Read the details you'll be hearing more in the coming weeks. Your takeaway today is I just want you to begin praying. Lord, what would you have me do here? How can I contribute to this, however big or however small? All right, I know we're getting long here. There's two quick announcements. Um, May 8th, there will be Mother's Day corsages available. Get your Hurley. They're available for free as long as they last. And OSL's own Drew Thompson, I think I know him, um, <laughs> will graduate from seminary in three weeks. He's received his first call in Lago Vista, Texas, so just outside of Austin. So we hope he has his ordination ceremony here uh, in the next month or so. So certainly be in prayer for Drew and his wife, Katie. Uh, I think it's time to bring this flight to a landing. Please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.